So what we're going to do now is we're going to look into the Word of God, and, and if you were given a bulletin when you came in, these scripture verses are going to be in the bulletin, they're going to be on the screen, uh, and you know why we do that, right? You know why we put them on the screen and we put them in the bulletin? It's because the most important thing that you can hear today is the scripture. What I say makes um, no difference. Hopefully I can just say enough to kind of set the thing up where you can understand the scripture. But the scripture is what really matters. And so, and so we put them on the screen so that you can see it, you know, big and bold. And then for the benefit of those of you who have trouble getting the bifocals adjusted, we put them in the bulletin for you. And so, you know, we want everybody to see the scripture. And so today, our lesson, you know, it's Christmas time. And so uh, last Sunday, we talked about no room at the inn. And today we're going to talk about what, what Christmas means to shepherds. You know, in several of the songs that the praise team sang today, they mentioned the shepherds. And, and so today we're going to talk about those shepherds and what Christmas means to shepherds. We're going to start in Luke chapter 2, verse number 11. Luke chapter 2, verse number 11. This is an incredible verse. This is what an angel said to a group of shepherds. He said, there is born to you this day in the city of David a savior, a rescuer, a deliverer, who is Christ the Lord. You know what impresses me? The first people that God told about the birth of his son, about God actually becoming a human being to rescue the world, was a bunch of roughneck, rowdy shepherds. Don't you love that? Listen to me, we're going to talk about shepherds in just a little bit, and if, if God cared for shepherds, because they were a pretty rough bunch, then God cares for every one of us. Isn't that amazing? So I've been doing some thought lately, giving some thought lately about what Christmas must have meant to these shepherds. And I suppose, I suppose it means different things to different people. Are you aware of that? Christmas doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. Not everybody understands the significance of what Christmas is all about. You see, I, I begin to wonder, and I wonder what Christmas means to a mother who has lost her husband and now must raise three kids without his help, working every day, never quite making um, ends meet, never quite getting everything together. I wonder what Christmas means to her. Probably not the same thing it means to some of the rest of us. I wonder what Christmas means to the little man in Zimbabwe, 80 years old, living in a mud hut. He's never seen or even heard of a shopping mall or a Christmas tree but he's heard the good news. I wonder what Christmas means to him. I wonder what Christmas means to the little North Korean children growing up under the control of a brutal communist dictatorship with smudges on their cheeks and sparkling eyes as they look up and wonder when some foreign stranger with his lily white skin walks past. I wonder what Christmas means to them. Like I said, I'm sure it means different things to different people. You see, to U.S. retail merchants, Christmas means the busiest time of the year. Their stores stay open longer and they hire extra people to accommodate all the shoppers. To them, Christmas means more profit. Hopefully even enough profit to carry them through the lean months that are ahead. To some American employees, Christmas means a Christmas bonus a little more money in their pockets to do the things that they've been wanting to do during the holiday season. For many American teenagers and adults, Christmas means time for fun and parties. But sometimes I, I get the feeling that we're like the folks who decided to throw a party to honor a very special friend. They sent out invitations, they decorated the dining room, they had the food catered, everyone came at the scheduled time, but to their surprise, the guest of honor didn't show up. And finally, they made the embarrassing discovery that no one had invited him. I wonder if that happens to us sometimes during the holidays. Do we go through all the decorating, the gift purchasing, and the elaborate meal preparation and then somehow forget whose birthday it is that we're celebrating? Remember what the angel said to the shepherds? The real reason for all the celebration and all the hoopla? 
There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This Savior who is Christ the Lord is the one whose birth we celebrate. So an important spiritual lesson to consider in this busy culture in which we live in modern day America is that in the midst of all of the busyness of the Christian season, it's easy to lose sight of the one whose birth we are celebrating. Do you get that? It is estimated by people who take polls in the U.S. that more than 80% of American households who celebrate Christmas, which is almost 100% of them, never read the Christmas story during the celebration. You get that? How sad that is. So let's talk about, about the story of the shepherds. Let's talk about what Christmas probably meant to them. I want us to read the story. It was recorded by Luke there in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 17. And this is what he wrote. Now, there were in the same country, that's near the city of Bethlehem in Judea, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Now, I want to stop here. I want to pause here. Uh, you know, I, I want to be relevant in our preaching. Um, every time in Scripture I find an angel appearing to somebody, do you know what the response to the human being is? They are terrified. They are so frightened that sometimes they actually faint. They pass out. Roman soldiers at the tomb of Jesus guarding the tomb when the angels showed up. Those card, calloused, gruesome Roman soldiers passed out when they saw an angel. They were so frightened. When the angel appeared to Mary to tell her that she was going to be the, the birth of the son, uh, the mother of the Son of God, she was going to give birth to him, she immediately was fearful. And the angel, the first thing he said to her was, Fear not, Mary. I mean, he shows himself to her and she's horrified. And he says, Now don't be afraid. And you just read through the scriptures. Almost every time an angel appears to somebody, they are frightened out of their wits. And then I hear people telling these wonderful spiritual sounding stories about an angel appearing in my room and giving me this wonderful sense of peace and giving me this great message and it was just a wonderful glow and I, I just felt so good in the presence of this angel. That, my friend, is not biblical. You get that? They were frightened every time. What I want you to understand is this. There may have been something appear in your room, but it was not an angel. Because you got to remember that even Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Do you get that? It's so important that we get in the book, and when we get in the book and we begin to see what the Scriptures actually say about these different encounters and about these different circumstances in life, and then we make sure that our circumstances in life line up with what the book says, and if they don't, then we've got to understand that the devil is probably trying to deceive us and lead us into something that we don't need to be in. So it's important that you get that, that there's no extra charge for that. That's not in the notes, but I just thought I needed to throw that in. And so they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, here it is, do not be afraid. He knew they were fearful. So do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Get this. They should have known the Jewish people should have known this from the beginning, but they didn't get it. Because look what the first thing the angel tells them. He's telling a bunch of Jewish shepherds, and they're going to go spread this good news. Look at this. Um, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to who? All people. But you know what the Jews thought prior to this and after this, all the way up until they crucified Jesus? Do you know what the Jews thought? That God didn't care about anybody but Jews. That's what they thought. If you were a Gentile, they didn't believe, you know, a Gentile is a non-Jew. They didn't think God cared about you. They thought God only cared about the Jews. And as a result of that, they thought you were just a dog. 
They didn't even want to be close to you, and let alone touch you, because you were unclean, and that might make them unclean. They certainly wouldn't go into your house and eat with you, because heaven forbid that you dirty them up. They didn't think that God cared about anybody they considered to be dirty. Aren't you glad that the angel made this first announcement? And he said, I'm bringing you good tidings. That means good news of great joy, which shall be to whom? All people, the good, the bad, the ugly, the red, the yellow, the black, the white, the addict, the pedophile, the lesbian, the homosexual, the serial killer. God loves us all. And this message of good news with great joy was for who? All people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. My friend, the highest act of God that brought him more glory than anything else he has ever done to this point in human history is when God chose to become human so he could die for us. That's what the story of the birth of Jesus is all about. God chose to become a human being. He was Emmanuel. He was God with us. God couldn't die in his natural state because he was eternal. And so God said, I'm going to become human so I can die. And that's what he did. He died on a cross about 33 and a half years later so he could take all of the punishment that we deserve for our sin and purchase for us the incredible gift of eternal life. I'm not sure how much of that those shepherds understood. But they had to be excited about God's good will toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste. In other words, they hurried and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. I love that. He was born in a stable. And his first cradle was a manger. And they laid him in there, and the shepherds showed up and saw him there. And when they had seen him, they made known, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. I love this. If you ever really begin to understand who this child is, you will not be able to keep it to yourself. And so the fact that God made this announcement of the birth of the Savior to the shepherds helps us, helps us understand a few things about what Christmas really means. You see, shepherds were not an influential or respected segment of Jewish society. They lived in the fields with the animals they tended, and more often than not, they smelled like them too. You get that? Sometimes when people come into churches and they don't smell like the rest of us, we tend not to want them there. Is that sad? That's really, really sad. When I was 19 years old, Miss Jenny and I, we moved from northeast Arkansas up to central Indiana with the wild-eyed notion that we could start a church. And we, and, and we moved up there just saying that this is what Jesus wants us to do. And Jesus is going to plant a church here in the city of about 5,500 people. And there's no good, solid gospel witness in the city. And we believe God wants us to go there and just tell people about Jesus and start this church that will just tell other people about Jesus. And we did that. And we moved up there. And we moved into this house. And you know, Miss Jenny is a woman of great faith. You realize that? <clears throat> The first trip that I went up there with the pastor of the church that was sending us up there, I was 19 years old, and he said, we need to see if we can find a house for you and your wife to live in and make some kind of an arrangement to buy a house for you to live in. And he said it would be good if it was a house that could actually, you could live in it and have church in it for a while until, you know, we see how, what the Lord's going to do here. And, and so um, I called her up and said, we think the Lord wants us to buy this house. Now, this is the first home we had ever owned. She is eight hours away. And she said, then buy the house. 
I said, do you think you want to see the house? Oh, she said, no. Just buy the house. Let me ask you this. How many women do you know that would give their husband permission to buy a house that they have never seen? And she did that. She just did that. It was just amazing. She's a great woman. She's the best part of the package. Most of you know that. And so... And so what I'm trying to tell you is the rest of the story is that we bought this house and and we we moved all of our earthly belongings. And you know, when you're 19, you're not very smart, right? I mean, let's just be honest. I was 19 years old. I wasn't very smart. We, We lived in Northeast Arkansas in this old broken down house. We had old broken down furniture. If every bit of it had burned up, it wouldn't have been worth $50. We had nothing. And we, we didn't have any more sense but to rent a U-Haul truck and haul all of our broken down stuff to Indiana. We spent more on the U-Haul truck than the stuff was worth. I think back about that and I think, what an idiot. Too bad somebody didn't tell me that. You know, explain that to me. And so, and so we did that. We moved up there. We moved it th- into this house. And about three days later, you know, I'm a missionary now. I'm, I'm going up here to start this church. I've never been a missionary before. I really don't know what to do. And said, I guess what I got to do is we got to start, go start telling people we're here. And so I printed up these little brochures, just like the ones we use today with the Romans Road in it. And I printed up and I just started going house to house. And I said, all I know to do is go just tell people about Jesus. And I just started going from house to house, telling people about Jesus, telling people about Jesus. A few people got saved and just telling people about Jesus. And, and that, that Sunday, when we had church for the very first time, three little kids showed up. Two sisters with a little brother. They had scabies. They had head lice. They were dirty. They smelled bad. But they showed up. And if you had seen us, you would have thought the Queen of England had come. We were so excited about those three dirty, snotty-nosed, smelly little kids. And we just took them in, and, and we, had, we had kids' church that Sunday, and we just loved on them, and they went home, and they were so excited, and they told their mother, who was a terrible alcoholic, and guess what happened the next Sunday? Virginia came, not sober, smelling like a brewery, but Virginia came, and we didn't have any more sense than to just love her and tell her the Jesus story, and a few weeks later, she got saved. And then she was so excited about what had happened, she told her mother-in-law, who had for years been the town prostitute. And grandma came, and grandma got saved. And before you know it, those little kids' daddy came. I mean, it was a broken home, and, and, but, but they told their daddy what had happened, and he came, and he was a town drug dealer. His name was Gary, and he got saved. And I began to tell people what God was doing. And they said, you can't build a church on that kind of people. And my heart was broken. Seven years later when we left, those kind of people had contributed themselves and enough of their resources to buy three and a half acres of prime property and build a building debt-free. Hundreds of people got saved. Not long before we left, we thought we had done what we were supposed to do there. We turned the church over to this kid that we led to the Lord, and he kind of grew up. We discipled him in the church. He became the pastor. We went back to Arkansas. Before we left, there was 101 people in our house one Sunday for church. And we had over 100 people once we moved into this new building. And that church is still going today. You get that? It doesn't make any difference who they are or where they've come from. Jesus loves them. And that's why, I think that's why God chose to tell the shepherds first. He told them that first. And and that's the way these shepherds were. They weren't a respected segment of the Jewish society. Um, 
You know, they just, they, they tended their animals, and like I said, often they smelt like those animals. They had almost no wealth of any kind. They were lacking in character. They were notoriously immoral. If you read a little bit of secular history about the first century in Palestine and some of those, those little villages and those larger towns in Palestine when the shepherds were, were grazing their flocks and, and, and if the shepherds would, would leave their flocks and come into town to get surprised, to, to get supplies, you know what most of the what shopkeepers would do? Close up their shops because they were afraid the shepherds would steal them blind. And they'd close up there. I mean, that's the kind of people we're talking about here who were the shepherds. They were just, they were just a bad lot. And yet God's angel came to shepherds and said, there is born to you this day, to you. Don't you love that? There is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And that one simple announcement God made known through his angel, some very important truth. Some very important truth. I'm going to give you three things that I see from God telling that to these shepherds. The first one is God loves you. God loves you. No matter how insignificant and undeserving and immoral and have bad character and have a bad reputation and made a lot of mistakes along the way, no matter when the rest of the world rejects you, God loves you because he loved the shepherds. God loves you. Jesus said it like this, God so loved the world. That included the shepherds. That includes the insignificant and the undeserving and the immoral and those who have made mistakes and the broken and the battered and the bruised. And he says, God loves the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. How much does God love you? So much that he would give up the most precious possession of his heart, his only son, and allow him to die on a Roman rack of execution called a cross so that all of these undeserving, broken people in the world could have eternal life. When God chose to make this profound announcements to the shepherds, it, like, it was like he was saying to the world, if I love shepherds enough to give my son for them, then I certainly love you. And that's why the angel said to those shepherds, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So an important spiritual lesson for us to remember is this, if God loves shepherds, then God certainly loves loves you. On those days when the devil comes and tries to lie to you and remind you of your past and remind you of your brokenness and remind you of your sin and remind you of your history and remind you of your reputation and when the devil tries to do all of that for you, you remember God loves shepherds and God loves people just like you. Get that? And then here's another thing. Here's what I learned. Your life matters. You matter. You know, we have this movement in the world today in America that's been going on for a few years since the stuff that happened up in, uh, I can't remember the name of the town where the racial tension, you know, erupted and all of that stuff. What was the name of that place? Ferguson. Yeah, since Ferguson happened, you know, we got this Black Lives Matter. Calvin, Black Lives Matter. Amen? But guess what? White lives matter. Brown lives matter. Red lives matter. Broken lives matter. Rich lives matter, poor lives matter. Bottom line is this, people matter to God. I imagine those shepherds must have sat around the campfire many times and wondered if their lives really mattered. After all, they were only shepherds. They must have asked themselves more than once, what difference does it make if we watch these sheep or not? They're not our sheep. They belong to somebody else. The lives of these shepherds mattered. After the, they heard the angel's announcement and saw the baby, they realized just how much their lives mattered. Luke wrote this in verse 17. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. You know why they were so excited to spread the news about this baby? Because the whole incident screamed at them and said, you matter to God. How many people are running around in your circle of influence today who really don't believe they matter? They've been told they don't matter. 
They've been told they're not important. They've been told they'll never amount to anything. They've gone into churches and been shunned and been rejected and kind of been ostracized. But listen, this story screams everyone matters, even shepherds. Their lives mattered because now they had a message from God to share with everyone they met. Look at what it says. They made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. Now their lives mattered because they had a message. Do you get that? And listen, if you know Jesus, if you understand who this baby is, and if he has come into your life and radically changed you from the inside out by giving you his incredible gift of eternal life, you have a message to tell. And if you have a message, a life-changing, life-giving message to share with the world, your life matters. Don't you ever forget that. Your life matters. An important spiritual lesson to learn from this response of the shepherds is that if you have a message from God to share, your life matters. Don't let the devil talk you out of that. Here's a third one. Faith moves people to action. Faith moves people to action. If you say you have faith in God, but you are not interested in doing anything for God, I question the reality of your faith. You say, you're judging me. No, I'm not. But I'm sure questioning the reality of your faith based on Scripture. Because faith produces work. Faith produces a desire to do something for God. Look at what the shepherds did. These shepherds were simple men with no education, no wealth, no prestige. But they had more faith than the highly educated, fabulously wealthy, prestigious leaders of their day. The religious leaders didn't have enough faith to believe God's announcement that the Savior was born. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe the Savior was born. Because Jesus didn't fit their preconceived ideas of what the Messiah, what the Savior was going to be like. Let me give you a little advice. If you ever get serious about Jesus, throw all of your preconceived ideas about who he is overboard and get in this book and see who he really is. Because I guarantee you that since you've been old enough to process information, the devil has been doing everything he can to fill your mind with information about Jesus that is inaccurate so that you get a concept of who Jesus is that's totally opposite and totally different from the Jesus of the book. So leave all of that stuff at the door and check in and begin to get in the book and see who Jesus really is. The first century Jews weren't willing to do that. And when God sent his son, born of this virgin in this, in this stable and, and cradled in a manger in Bethlehem, grew up in the carpenter shop in abject poverty, was an itinerant preacher among the hills of Judea and along the seashores of Galilee. And they heard him teach and they saw his miracles and they looked at what he did. But because of their preconceived ideas about who he would be, they didn't recognize him when he came right into them face to face. And I'm afraid a lot of people do that today. A lot of people do that today. And so, these religious leaders missed it. But Luke wrote this. He wrote this in, in verses 15 and 16. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them, from the shepherds into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, let us go, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. You see, the faith of these simple shepherds, their willingness to just believe the message that they had been told, what God had said to them through the angels, their willingness to believe that was their faith and that faith moved them to go and see this thing that had come to pass. 
They didn't just stay on the hillside watching their sheep anymore. They left the sheep. They went into Bethlehem. They investigated what the angel had said. They found it to be true. When they believed that it was true because they saw the evidence before them, then they went and, and not only did, did they go and see it for themselves, they went and told other people because they wanted other people to know it too. Faith always moves you to action. Genuine, real, biblical faith always moves people to action. So an important spiritual lesson to ponder is exactly that. Authentic faith will motivate you to go and make known the message of Christ. And that's what the shepherds did. That's what Luke said. He said, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. Now I want to tell you what they didn't do. They didn't go tell people about their religion. They didn't go tell people about their denomination. They didn't go try to make people Baptist or Pentecostals or Methodist or Presbyterians or whatever else. They went and just told people what they knew about this child. My friend, that's what the world needs today. They don't need to be Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterians or whatever else we may name. They need to know Jesus. And that's what they did. They just went and told them what the angels had told them concerning this child. Some years ago, a cartoon appeared in newspapers across the U.S. It pictured two farmers in Kentucky standing in a field as snow fell softly. One farmer turned to the other and asked, Anything exciting happening today? Nah, nothing exciting, said the other farmer. Oh, there was a baby born over at Tom Lincoln's place today, but nothing exciting ever happens around here. That baby born in the home of Tom Lincoln that day later became President Abraham Lincoln. Something exciting had happened that day, and nobody knew it. You see, President Lincoln changed the course of U.S. history, effectively ending slavery in America. Something exciting happened that day at Tom Lincoln's farm, and nobody knew it. Here's what I get from that story about Abraham Lincoln, and I realize that's not a biblical story, but it's a true story. One life can make a difference. You get that? Somebody has once said that the world is yet to see... The difference that can be made by the life of one man or one woman who is totally committed to the cause of Christ. I think one of the greatest examples we have of that is recorded in Scripture in the book of Acts when you read the life and times of the Apostle Paul. He single-handedly changed the world of his day because of his tireless preaching of the message of Jesus. We need to be doing the same thing today. I wonder if there were people in Bethlehem on that night long ago asking, anything exciting happening today? Maybe, maybe uh, they were told, no, nothing much. Oh, I hear that some woman gave birth to a baby in a stable, but nothing exciting ever happens here in Bethlehem. Little did they know that the baby born in the stable that night in Bethlehem was the savior of the world. But the shepherds knew because the angel had said to them, there is born to you this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. And that's what Christmas meant to the shepherds. 